This video was sponsored by Skillshare. I have a link for you to try them out for free at the end of the video, so stick around. In 1998, the first video call ever over a cordless phone was demoed in a trade show in Japan almost a decade before the technology became widespread outside of the country. In 2000, Sharp launched the world's first mass market camera phone. In 2001, the Matsushita P2101V became the world's first proper 3G phone. And just a few years later, phones like the Sharp 912SH became commonplace in Japan, supporting contactless mobile payments, cameras with three or more megapixels, pixels, digital TV streaming, and more, well before the iPhone or Android were ever launched. It's a little hard to comprehend just how frenzied and technologically advanced all these Japanese phone makers in the 90s and early 2000s were from here in the West when we never really got to see any of their phones in person, and it is even stranger to see how they fell from that position to basically irrelevance by now. This kind of baffling headline especially caught my attention a few weeks ago. Sony's Xperia business has finally stopped shrinking. Um, that's true, I guess, but another way to look at that phrase would be to say that the company has yet again only managed to sell 600,000 smartphones last quarter. Less than companies like Samsung sell in a single day or to say that phones make up less than 4% of its revenues. There's just not much more shrinking Sony can do at this point. And even in its home market of Japan, they barely made it to the top five, beaten handily by first place Apple and second place Sharp, a company that is now majority owned by Taiwanese Foxconn. In fact, the three remaining Japanese smartphone brands collectively own less than 30% of the Japanese market these days and do almost no business outside of the country. All of which is to say Japanese smartphones are as good as gone. And in the 71st episode of the Story Behind series, we will explore both their meteoric rise and their catastrophic fall. The Japan of the late 90s and early 2000s was the perfect breeding ground for the emergence of incredible phones for three main reasons. First, decades of rapid post-war industrialization turned Japanese conglomerates into veritable giants. By 1989, Japanese companies like Sony, Panasonic, Toshiba and the like made up 32 of the world's top 50 companies by market capitalization. And almost all of them were technology companies at the bleeding edge of consumer electronics. In short, Japan had the ability to create new technologies like no other country. Second, with well over 100 million citizens, Japan had lots of consumers who had plenty of disposable income from their earlier economic miracle and a popular obsession with technology that is probably best exemplified by the technology-fueled animes or their early love for robotics. There was just an insatiable hunger for new tech in the country and a willingness to pay for it. And third, Japan's three large mobile carriers managed to pull something off that their foreign counterparts could only dream of. They built their own proprietary internet and services ecosystem people actually wanted to use. In the late 90s, they replaced the standard SMS protocols with their own proprietary email service that they customized to work on phones for texting. They rolled out custom services for weather, stocks, sports, and more. In 1999, they popularized their own custom mobile internet technologies like iMode, which was essentially a separate mobile focused internet using proprietary technologies like CHTML and payments as well as advertising handled by the carriers. And around 2004, they even started rolling out their mobile wallets powered by a custom version of NFC, allowing for the widespread adoption of contactless payments in the country at a time when I was just happy my Nokia phone could play MP3 files. In other words, Japanese carriers weren't just pipes that allowed data to flow between users and the services they wanted to use. The carrier themselves built and owned most of the popular services, controlled the ones that they didn't own, and were generally in charge of driving innovation. They forced domestic phone makers to include a physical iMode button, for example, to push their internet subscription service to the masses. They got them to include their custom NFC chips required for their mobile wallets, and so on creating a literal island of hyper-advanced proprietary technologies that was completely removed from the rest of the world. Fun fact, the Galapagos syndrome is what this evolution away from the rest of the world is called, and it is a common occurrence with other industries in Japan as well. Anyway, this incredible 1-2-3 combination of consumers who desperately wanted the latest technologies, conglomerates who could create all those technologies, and the carriers that built the services and the structure and the systems that connected them all and brought them all together, this was what catapulted Japan ahead of their competition and the rest of the world. 
until 2008, when it all suddenly started collapsing. iOS and Android came to Japan and both were fundamentally incompatible with the Japanese model. Specialized carrier-made services for checking the weather or stocks or sending texts with their own custom infrastructure were no longer needed, as apps requiring nothing but a standard data plan replaced all of them. And for the first time ever, the web, not some weird custom iMode version of the web, but the real internet in its full HTML glory became usable on phones. Almost overnight, the entire decades-long custom services model that Japanese carriers have pioneered became outdated, and all the control over innovation, together with all the profits that came with it, started to move over to Apple, Google, and the app makers, slowly turning carriers into just pipes carrying somebody else's data instead of end-to-end -end service providers. Not only that, this new form factor also meant trouble for the manufacturers. Previously, unique hardware designs and integrations with the carrier services meant that there was ample room for differentiation, and with that, for profit. But when all phones just became big touchscreens using standard components and a standard operating system, the potential for differentiation decreased sharply, competition from lower cost countries like China, Taiwan, and Korea increased sharply, and profitability became almost impossible. To make things worse, in 2008, SoftBank, the nation's third and smallest mobile carrier, decided to go all in on iPhones in a bid to differentiate itself from its rivals, launching an unprecedented promotional campaign across the country. And that same year, of course, the global financial crisis also reached Japan. With the Japanese economy already being in tatters before the crisis from a decade of economic stagnation, chronic debt issues, and declining wages across the country, known as the lost decade of Japan, these conglomerates were shadows of their former selves and each had many other business units to protect. So many decided that they had better uses for their money than investing billions into this new category of smartphones. Already troubled Mitsubishi Electric exited the market in 2008. That same year, Sanyo sold its phone business to Kyocera. Hitachi and Casio merged, with the last Casio-branded phone being released in 2013. Then both got absorbed into NEC, which itself got dissolved in 2016. Toshiba launched their last phone, the Android-powered Excite Go, in 2014. Sharp sold 66% of its shares to Taiwanese Foxconn in 2016. And Panasonic hasn't released a new phone since its Aluga, i7 in 2019 either. Left on the market are really only Kyocera, which has pivoted exclusively to making rugged phones for business customers, Fujitsu making the Aero line phones exclusively in Japan, Sharp selling its Aquos phones domestically, although under Taiwanese ownership, and of course Sony, the only company on this list that even tried building a globally relevant consumer-facing smartphone business at all. And while it's a little hard to point to a single reason why it didn't work for Sony either, I'd argue that they too eventually just found out that that their other businesses, like making highly lucrative image sensors, or the PlayStation, where they could own both the hardware and the software distribution and have decent margins, to be better investments long term than making mass market Android phones. The mobile wallet system pioneered in 2004 is still popular in the country, and IMO, which by the way peaked in 2008 with a pretty insane 80 million subscribers, so over two thirds of the population, is still around too. With NTT Docomo announcing that they'd only phase it out in 2026, as feature phones just refuse to die in Japan. That said though, the writing is pretty much on the wall. Even with a small comeback from Sony in the last generation, Japan will likely never fully recover its once glorious position. And that, I think, is quite sad. Anyway, I'm currently preparing a new project. It's going to be a series of documentaries where I talk to the people who design, manufacture, market, sell smartphones to get the whole insider perspective of this industry. I plan to do this with on-device, on-location shoots, meeting with people, IRL, interviews, all this kind of stuff. And since this is a skill that I currently don't have, I've never done this before, I'm currently watching a fantastic course on Skillshare about documentary filmmaking. Maybe your next dream project is not filmmaking, but designing an app or starting a YouTube channel or even a hobby like learning to do Japanese black ink painting. Skillshare almost certainly has a fantastic class for it that will help you succeed. 
My filmmaking class, for example, is almost two hours of fantastic advice that covers everything from filmmaking to storytelling and even the most technical details of putting together a one-person documentary film. And the platform is built for learning, with the topics being neatly structured, reviews to tell you whether a class is for beginners or for advanced students, and the ability to upload class projects so you can get feedback from the teachers or the other students. So get started with that project of yours. The first 1000 people to sign up using my link in the description will get a free trial to Skillshare Premium. And if you like it, and if you decide to stick around, then it's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. So check it out. Happy learning, and I'll see you in the next episode.